اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا رب الذين يقولون صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد
محمد وعلی محمد سلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان جابر بن عبد الله الانصاري فاطمه الزهراء عليه السلام بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه واله قال سمعت فاطمه انها قالت دخل على بي رسول الله في بعض الايام فقال السلام عليك يا فاطمه فقلت عليك السلام قال اني اجد في بدني ضعفا فقلت له اعوذك بالله يا بتاه من الضعف فقال يا فاطمه اتيني بالكساء الجمالي فغتني به فاتيته بالكساء اليماني فغتيته به فسرت انظر اليه واذا وجهه يتلالا كانه البدر في ليلتي تمامه وكماله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد فما كانت الا ساعه واذا بولد الحسن قد اقبل وقال السلام عليك يا امه فقلت عليك السلام يا قره عيني وسمرت فؤادي فقال يا امه اني اشم عندك رايه طيبه كان رايه جد رسول الله فقلت نعم ان جدك تحت الكساء فقبل الحسن ونحن نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جداه يا رسول الله اتعزن لي ان ادخل معك تحت الكساء وقال عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا صاحب حوزي قد اذنت لك فدخل معه تحت الكساء فما كانت الا ساعه واذا بولدي الحسين قد اقبل وقال السلام عليك يا امه فقلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرة عين وسمرت وسمرت فؤادي فقال لي يا امه اني اشم عندك رايه طيبه كانها رايه جد رسول الله صلى الله عليه واله فقلت نعم ان جدك وخاف تحت الكساء فزن الحسين نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جداه السلام عليك يا من اختاره الله وتأذن لي ان اقوم ان اكون معكما تحت الكساء فقال عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا شافي يا امتي قد اذنت لك فدخل معهما تحت الكساء فقال عند ذلك ابو الحسن علي بن ابي طالب وقال السلام عليك يا بنت رسول الله رسول الله فقلت عليك السلام يا ابو الحسن ويا امير المؤمنين فقال يا فاطمه اني اشم عندك رايه طيبه كان رايه اخي وابن امي رسول الله فقلت نعم ها هو ما ولديك تحت الكساء فقال علي نحو الكساء فقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله اتعزن لي ان اكون معكم تحت الكساء فقال له عليك السلام يا اخي ويا وسي وخليفتي وصاحب لواي قد اذنت لك فدخل علي تحت الكساء ثم اتيت نحو الكساء فقلت السلام عليك يا بتاه يا رسول الله اتعزن لي ان اكون معكم تحت الكساء قال عليك السلام يا بنتي يا ويا بزعتي قد اذنت لك فدخلت تحت الكساء 
ولا طالبوا حاجة إلا وكزلا حاجة فقال علي نزول الله فوزنا وسيدنا وكذلك شيعتنا فازوا وسيدوا في الدنيا والآخرة ورب الكعبة
दिल से ये 
تھی امام علیہ السلام کی اور دی امت نبی کو نہ حضرت نے بعد ہر وقت شہر کے لب پہ رہا شکر کے بریان اور سندھی کے تازیانوں کی ہر روز تھی جفا بہتا تھا خون جسم سے روحی الفدہ بہتا تھا خون جسم سے روحی الفدہ ایزائے قید ایسی کسی نے سہے نہ بیداد اس طرح کی کسی پر ہوئی اس طرح کی کسی پر ہوئے نہیں اور القصہ زہر آپ کو انگور میں دیا جسے جناب موسیٰ قاظم نے کی قضا اور بازوں نے لکھا ہے یہ شہادت کا ماجرہ بگلا کے شیش آپ کو جبرن پلا دیا بگلا کے شیش آپ کو جبرن پلا دیا اور کیسا کہوں کہ حال ہوا کیا امام کا جل کر ہوا کباب کلے جا امام کا جل کر ہوا کباب کلے جا امام کا اور گل پڑ گیا کہ موسیٰ قاظم نے کی قضا لاشے کو لا کے جسر پہ آدھا نے رکھ دیا اور چہرہ امام سے کپڑا ہٹا دو روز یوں ہی لاش کا چہرہ کھلا رہا دو روز یوں ہی لاش کا چہرہ کھلا رہا اور تھی لاش بے کفن شہ آل مقام تو کیر تھی آل رسول انام کی توکیر یہ دی آل رسول انام کی اور نزدیک بھائی تھا نہ پسر تھا نہ بھان جا تنہائی میں یہ ظلم و ستم و مصیبت اور دو روز تک تو جسر پہ لاشا پڑا میت پہ رونے والا بھی ہے ہے کوئی نہ تھا وہ صد میں اٹھا کہ ہائے جہاں سے گزر گئے غربت میں آہا قاضی میں نیشان مر گئے غربت میں آہا قاضی میں زیشان مر گئے وہ شیعہ نصار آپ کی غربت کے یا امام غربت میں تم شہید ہوئے اے شہے اور بے جرم مارا آپ کو یا شائے خاص حارون کیف کر دیا کام آپ کا کر دیا کام آپ کا تمام اور خوف خدا نہ خوف رسول خدا کیا شم حیات آپ کی اس نے بجھا دیا شم حیات آپ کی اس نے بجھا دیا سر پی جو آج مو بر محمد وائل محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم
Request for Surah Fatha from the families of tonight's sponsors. Jisar Surah Fatha for the Mahomin of Kanani family, Baba family, Pirani family, Mr. and Mrs. Akbar Muhammad Shagani. Surah Fatha. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي قصرت أن رؤيته يبصر الناظرين وعجزت عن نعته يوهام الباسفين الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين وبالقاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الماسومين الذين ذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين ينفقون في السراء والضراء والكاذبين الغيظ والعافين عن الناس والله يحب المحسنين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته condolences to all the مؤمنين والمؤمنات on this sad occasion upon which we commemorate the shahadat of our seventh imam condolences to imam of our time imam mahdi ajjalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif allahumma salli ala and at the same time we also commemorate the wafat of hazrat abu talib muslim islam alayhi salatu wassalam of course, these are the last few days of the month of Rajab al murajjab which of course serves as the month for preparation, serves as a month for us to get ready, month in which we should start preparing for the bigger nights which are upon us in a couple of weeks time after tomorrow when you perform the amal of the night of Mab'af and the Mi'raj and on 27th of Rajab, which is one of the most important days to keep a fast, one of the four days which are mentioned in the entire year. Tuesday will be 27th of Rajab, so make sure if you can, if you have the um, capability of fasting, you do hold the fast on that day. It is highly, highly, highly recommended and the reward of which cannot be enumerated if we were to sit down and count. 
And then before you know, you will be amongst those who will be writing the Arida to Imam of our time on Nila Shaban, 15th of Shaban. And after that, it is only downhill until we embrace the month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, month in which we are the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are the youth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the month of great mehmandari, which we all look forward to. A person came to our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq al wasalam. He asked Imam, was Abu Dhar and Salman superior or are you superior? Imam said to him, how many months are there in the calendar year? He said, four. Imam said, how many of them are muhtaram? Uh, well, he said, 12. He said, how many of them are muhtaram? He said, four out of the 12. The Rajab is one of them. We have the Qad, the Hij, and Muharram. Four out of the 12 months are muhtaram. Imam said, the wujud of Abu Dhar and Salman amongst you guys is like these muhtaram months. The month of Rajab, the month of the Qad, the month of uh, Muharram. These are considered to be arba'atun minhum hurum, as the ayat of Surah Tawbah tells us that there are 12 months in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of four, out of them, four of them are muhtaram. The wujud of Salman and Abu Dhar is like these four months amongst the rest of the months of the year. He said, where is month of Ramadan? He said, yes, month of Ramadan is there. Is it par part of those four muhtaram? He said, no, it's not part of those muhtaram. But is it more superior than all of those months? He said, absolutely. That's what we have heard in the Rawayat. Imam said, then that is the wujud of us, ma'asumin, as the month of Ramadan, which is not even considered or counted amongst those months which are considered to be muhtaram. So therefore, don't compare ma'asumin with ghayre ma'asum. And that is the way Imam al-Sattu gave the example of such individuals, even those who were considered to be what? As-Salmanu minna ahlul bayt. Salman was not an ordinary individual. It was to the extent that he was considered to be part of ahlul bayt. But nonetheless, this ayat which I recited and I have recited in the past as well from Surah Ali Imran, ayat number 134, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights this important concept of giving. He says, Alladina yunfiquna fi sarra'i wa tarra. Those who go and spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at ease or at adversity. Whether you are going through a difficult time in your life, whether you are going through ease in your life and there isn't any trouble troubling you, these are the people who are not neglectful from the duty of giving infaq in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sakhawat and the generosity is what's needed, not money what is needed to be become muttaqi. In order for a person to be muttaqi does not mean that he has to give a whole lot, but a person is the one who's muttaqi, is someone who is even facing adversity is still capable of giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it doesn't matter how much or how little, it matters that at what time, the critical time, because a lot of time we go out and say, well, you know, we're hand to mouth ourselves. It's very difficult for us to get by ourselves. How are we going to go ahead and help anyone out? This is where the Iman is checked that Alladina Yunfiquna Tissarrae what the rae walkadimin al ghaib and then adds on another attribute of these individuals who are muttaqeen. How do we know with these other attributes of muttaqeen? Refer to the previous ayah, ayah number 133 of Al Imran ends with muttaqeen and then begins the a sifat of those muttaqeen, that these are the people who spend in the way of Allah, do infaq, whether they're going through a difficult time, whether they're not going through a difficult time, al-kadameen al ghaib and they are those who are able to suppress their anger. Yes, suppress their anger. It's easy said than done. All of us are culprit of this, that many a time, how anger gets the best of us. How anger goes out to be the reason that we end up making some of the mistakes that we regret. If you have ever regretted in your life, let it be known that anger has something to do with it. So make sure that you're able to adopt this attribute, which is associated with our seventh Imam, Imam Musa al kazim alayhi salatu wasalam. That he's Qadimul Ghayb. 
Again, it's redundant to say that why is it only associated with seventh imam were not other imams called I mean, Of course, they were all called I mean. But this is what we saw more as a highlight in the life of our seventh imam. Thus, this attribute is fixed with his name, Musa al Kazim. Kazimin al Ghayz, those who are able to suppress their anger, and a bigger ability after having able to suppress your anger is to be able to forgive people. Yes. When someone has done something to you where a lot of times we say, well, I don't want to see this person's face. I don't want to talk to this individual. No, a bigger person at that point would be the one who would say, I forgive this individual. That's why the Holy Prophet Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam, said, do you want me to inform you about the best of the akhlaq of this world? And the hereafter. People say, yes, of course, Rasulullah. We want to know the akhlaq that will be needed in the hereafter. And of course, we want to know the best of the akhlaq of this world as well. He says, Al-afwu amman zalamaka. That's the first thing Rasul mentioned. Al-afwu amman zalamaka. Those of you who are Accustomed to praying Salatul Layl, you say something in Salatul Layl, Al Afu, Al Afu, Al Afu. You repeat this in some rawayat 300 times, in some rawayat more, some less, whatever the case may be. But you say Al Afu. You're asking for, you know, this forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah said, Al Afu amman zalamaka. Forgive the one who has done zulm against you. If a person has by mistake done zulm against us, we never forgive them. This is when a person has on purpose with propaganda has done zulm against you. Rasulullah says, Al -afu amman Forgive the one who has done zulm against you. These are the sifat khair al khala'iq al dunya wal akhirah. That are the best of the akhlaq of this world and the akhlaq of the hereafter. You know, the remaining of the hadith, of course, has beautiful points in it, but that will take me away from my uh, discussion. We look at And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are righteous doers of righteousness. Of course, this ayat we use as the ayat in which the word Kazim appears. So it fits the criteria for tonight's discussion that is in regards to an imam who's also referred to as Kazim. But don't be fooled by the name. Imam's name is Musa, right? Kazim is his sifat. His name is Musa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in Musa in Quran, whose sifat is mentioned to be Ghadban. One of the sifat of Hazrat Musa is Ghadban in Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions when Hazrat Musa came back after his niqat, he came back and he grabbed a hold of Hazrat Harun with his lahya, with his uh, beard. And so Hazrat Harun had to say, Yabna ummi, oh, my brother, in other words, uh, don't do this to me. These people did not listen to me. They ended up following the path and they ended up worshiping it. I tried to stop them. It has nothing to do with me. Hazrat Musa came back in the state. He was Ghadban. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in Quran. So there's the sifat of a Nabi who's called Musa, whose sifat is Ghadban. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show that not all Musas are Ghadban in order to show the other side of another Musa. He created Hazrat Musa al-Kadim placed him in the middle of the imamat that if you want to see Nabuwat and Nabi who's Musa might have the sifat of Ghazban but if you look towards the imam who's Musa his sifat you will find to be Halim his sifat you will find to be someone who's forgiving and Kadimul Ghaiz Salatim Muhammad wa Muhammad and then don't be fooled by the name there's a Harun alongside with Hazrat Musa والسلام, who's Nabi of Allah and there's a Harun alongside with Imam Musa Kazim as well. That Harun is the Danashin of Hazrat Musa. This Harun is the murderer and the one who's responsible for killing and taking the life of Imam Musa Kazim So brothers and sisters, before I get into the discussion, 
uh, that there is a ma'rifat and the level of ma'rifat which is needed. What is the ma'rifat of ours to our imams? We have these majalis. One of the purposes of this majlis should be to gain the ma'rifat of imam, to get closer to imam. Every year this majlis azar comes by. Every year we gather and we commemorate this majlis. Every year we give fursa and we do all of those things. Are we making strides to get closer and closer to Imam? Because there were many people who lived near Imam in the time of Imam Muthar Kazim who were against him. They had more knowledge and ma'rifat of Imam than you and I. So one thing is for sure, you don't have to be close to Imam to have the greatest of the ma'rifat. You don't have to be close to Rasulullah to have the greatest of the ma'rifat. There are people who are buried next to Rasulullah, but God knows what will happen once the day of Qiyamah comes. So having this closeness in the physical sense may not be very beneficial to you. Imam Ibn Zakazim said to, uh, in fact, our eighth Imam said to uh, Mamun, when Mamun was running away, Imam said, where do you run away? you will be the same place as me when Khatan comes for the burial, right? You and I will be buried in the same place. And therefore we find that the ma'rifat of Imam is something which is important. There are three levels of ma'rifat that are mentioned. Let's see which level are you and I at. First level of ma'rifat that ulama mentioned, the scholars mentioned is the ma'rifat jalali Second level of ma'rifat is the ma'rifat jamali and the third level of ma'rifat is the ma'rifat of kamali. Jalali, jamali and kamali. These are the three levels of ma'rifat. What are these three levels? I'll give you an example so that the younger kids over here would also understand. Jalali ma'rifat is then let's say you were walking and you saw a mountain from far distance because mountains can be seen from long, long distance. When you see a mountain from far away, this is your marifat jalali Why? Because you know it's a mountain, not a tree. You know it's a mountain, not an animal. You know it's a mountain, not a human. That much you can tell. So from far distance, you can tell it's a mountain and it's not something other than a mountain. So that is the marifat known as the marifat jalali You only know what you see from far distance. When you get closer to it, when you're able to see the height of this mountain, when you're able to see the other intricacies of this mountain, and maybe the beauty of that mountain, this is marifat jamali that you're now close enough to appreciate the height of this mountain. And then third marifat, which is marifat kamali the perfect marifat, which is needed in you and I, is when you climb this mountain and you get to the peak of this mountain, at that point when you have accomplish something as far as this mountain is concerned and how high it was and how you're able to get on top of it. This is the marifat known as marifat kamali You know what? What is needed for you and I to have the marifat of Imam, not marifat jalali Not marifat jalali but what is expected from you and I is marifat kamali of Imam Masum. Because even those who lived in the time of Imam, Harun al-Rashid, who's the enemy of Imam, has more marifat. Because he knows Imam who's he, he knows Imam's father, he knows Imam's son, he knows Imam's children, he knows all these things regarding Imam. The enemy might have more knowledge of Imam, but having more knowledge is not enough. Having this marifat is something which is required. And that is the reason what did Harun try to do? Harun tried to keep Imam busy and occupied in debates, he asked one of the you know scholars of the time to come and debate with Imam. And when that scholar came and he asked Imam al a question from Hajj, he said to Imam that uh, what is the kafara? Why is there a kafara for someone? If someone goes under the shade, is there a kafara? Imam said, yes, there's a kafara. If you're in the halat of Aram and you go under the shade. When you're moving, there's kafara. That's why those who go on for Hajj and Umrah, when you get in the bus from Medina, you pass through the Miqat, you travel at night. So there's no kafara on you. But if you travel during the day, it becomes a kafara, becomes liable upon you. 
He said, then why isn't there any kafara when we go inside our tent? So there's kafara when you're traveling. When you go under the shade, there's kafara. But when you go under the tent, there's no kafara. Imam asked him, tell me, why is it that women in certain days, they cannot perform the ibadat, but when they miss their ibadat, the salat that they miss, they don't have to make up. But the fast that they missed, they have to perform the qaza of the fast that they have missed. He said, yes, that's true. Imam said, which is more important, fast or salat? He said, salat is more important. But it's still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has excused them of making up the salat qaza because it will be too much. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not excuse them from making up the qaza of the fast that they have missed. He said, true. Imam said, why is it? He said, because of the hukum of Allah. Imam said, over there is the hukum of Allah. Over here is also the hukum of Allah. That when you are traveling, you cannot be under the shade. When you are sitting, you can be under the shade. And there's no contradiction because both are done with ta'abud and the servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salat bihi Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So our ma'rifat should be that ma'rifat al-kamari of Imam. That we have the understanding that not just that Imam was born on 7th of Safar in the year 128, Imam Shahada takes place in the year 183 on the 26th day or the 25th day of uh, month of Rajab. And Imam's father was sixth Imam and his mother was uh, um, this lady uh, Hamida or Humaida as the name in certain riwayat has come. Al-Barbariya who was from Maghreb and uh, you know other sifat of this great lady that are mentioned. One of the sifat of this lady, which the mothers of Imams who are not talked about a great deal, one of the sifat of this great lady, which is worth mentioning because we were on the discussion of Hajj as well, that the birth of seventh Imam did not take place in Medina, did not take place in Makkah, rather it took place in a place called Abuwa. Where's Abuwa? Abuwa is in the middle of Mecca and Medina. The reason Imam was born in Abuwa and not in Medina or Mecca is because his mother was traveling with Imam, sixth Imam, after having performed the Hajj, they were coming back home and on the way to Medina, on the way to Medina in the place called Abuwa, the birth of our seventh Imam takes place. Can you imagine? In those days when traveling is so difficult, Going to Hajj, that ibadah, which is the most ibadah, as far as the physical um, expectations are concerned, that's why you need to have three types of istita'at in order to perform Hajj. Financial ability, physical ability, and the path should also be wide open for you. If these paths are not open, then Hajj is not obligatory upon you. With all the difficulties, the emphasis by the parents of our seventh imam, is that even in the stage that his mother is pregnant and expecting Imam, she goes and performs Hajj and on the way back, in the middle of the path, she gives birth to our seventh Imam, Imam Musa Kazim If this, If this does not raise the level of importance of this ibadah, then I don't know what with, how much we are neglectful of this ibadah, that so much emphasis from the Imams. And therefore, when we're on the subject of the Kamali, um, you know, um, recognition and the ma'rifat of Imam, none other than Salman Farsi. Remember the story that people used to say, well, whenever we go to see Ali ibn Abi Talib, we find Salman is always there. One day they did ta'ahud by themselves that we'll beat him to masjid. We'll leave early in the morning and we'll arrive so that nobody's there and we'll be able to beat Salman. When they saw, they walked outside, they saw only one, you know, pair of, you know, uh, feet, the signs of one pair of feet that were leading to the masjid. They said, that means no one else walked from by over here. Only one person walked by over here. That is Amir al-Mu'min. When they arrived in the masjid, what did they see? Salman is sitting next to Amir al-Mu'min. He said, yeah, Salman, we did not even see your footsteps. How did you get here so quickly? Salman said, the reason you don't see my footsteps is because I placed my feet on the steps that were created by Amir al-Mu'mineen and I got to the masjid. Yani Salman is not saying the ittiba'i 
Asli is that you step on the steps of Masoom. He's saying, I do the ittiba of Masoom to the extent that I don't wish to place my feet anywhere else where the signs of the feet of Masoom Imam had gone through. That is the Ma'rifat of Salman. That's why he's considered to be a Salman or Minna Ahlul Bayi. So that Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Some of the alqab of Imam is that he's known as Babu Hawaij. And this is where we find even the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, such as Imam Shafi, such as Shaykh Hanabila, and even uh, other um, you know, scholars such as Ibn Shar Ashub, Khatib Baghdadi, they said whenever we had any issues in understanding any difficult thing, we would go for the ziyarat of Imam Musa Qadim. His grave was tiriyaqul mujarrab, and everything that we had as far as our questions were concerned would be resolved just by visiting the grave of this great personality. These such ulama, Sheikh Hanabila, Imam Shafi'i, and then Khatib Baghdadi, these weren't ordinary individuals. When they are highlighting the aspect of the ziyarat of Imam, and that's why, you know, it is considered to be second Arba'een in Iraq. The ziyarat of our seventh Imam around the time of his shahadat, the amount of people that walk is considered to be second Arba'een. First Arba'een is, of course, Arba'een of Husseini. When people walk and march from different places and they arrive in Karbala, but this is the place where we see that people are walking from all different directions to arrive in Kalman to have this huge gathering. And that is the reason because the seventh Imams, you know, this attraction that people had from the beginning up until now, the attraction that people had, that when a person comes with the ma'rifat of Imam and arrives at the door of Imam, does not go back without having his hadad fulfilled from this great personality. Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. One of the names of Imam that is mentioned is Abdus Saleh. And the reason Abdus Saleh is referred to our Imam is because, you know, Abdus Saleh means a righteous servant. And many rawayat that are narrated from our seventh Imam have the name Abdus Saleh. Qala Abdus Saleh. The reason Abdus Saleh, not his real name or his real kunniyat, Abu al Hasan or Musab Nijafar. Is the reason because it was a time of taqiyya. It was the time of dissimulation. It was a time when people really had to hide their faith. They couldn't go about uh, showing that they were the followers of Maktab al Tashayyu. You should feel proud. You should feel safe. You should feel that you are privileged, that you don't have to live in the era and the time when it's difficult for you to claim yourself to be the Shia of Ahlul Bayt. There was a time in the time of seventh Imam that people were deprived of even seeing the Imam of their time. And the reason was because the hukumat was always on the look, after, look out for these individuals. Imams, there are many stories of the merits and the fadail of Imam. He's only five years old. Of course, he's with his father, sixth Imam, who's uh, Sadiq Ali Muhammad, but he's sitting with his father. And one of the Imams of Ahl Sunnah, Abu Hanifa, comes. And when he comes, he has a question in regards to the important concept of Jabr and Ikhtiyar. Jabr and Ikhtiyar, if I can just explain in one word, is that are we forced or do we have complete freedom? And if you were to ask the question that in our lives, are we forced or do we have freedom to do whatever we want? I think many will answer by saying that we are free to choose and do whatever we want. But this is where a lot of times things become complicated. Then when we end up doing certain things, so well, we were forced because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the knowledge of what we're going to do. And this is where a lot of these theologians, they fell in trap by saying, because Allah has the previous knowledge of what we are going to do, then committing the sins becomes what? There's the justification for doing the sins. And that's why many, in order to save, in order to protect these personalities, I don't want to use the word personality in front of Yazid and Muawiyah, in order to protect them, what did they do? They said, well, someone had to do these things. They were majboor and they ended up doing this. In fact, some people have gone ahead saying they did ishtihad. Forget about majboori. They did ishtihad. 
Why? Because ishtihad is where the concept of ishtihad that you and I have, that mujtahid is someone who works hard, who strives, and he produces these masail shar'i from the different sources that exist. If he gets the mas'ala correct, then Allah gives him double the reward. If he gets the mas'ala wrong, Allah still rewards him for trying. He said, well, Yazid and Muawiyah, they were doing ishtihad as well. They were mujtahideen. Because they got it wrong, they stood up against Imam Ali, they stood up against Amir Imam Hussein. They were wrong in doing so. We acknowledge that. But still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them because they did ishtihad. This is the way this bogus, you know, uh, aqidah is mentioned. So Imam says, the concept of jabr and tafweez or jabr and ikhtiyar mentioned. Imam said, there are three scenarios. Number one, insan has absolute freedom. Number two, insan has zero freedom, meaning Allah di dictates everything. Number three, insan and the creator are both sharik as far as the actions and the amal are concerned. He said, first one, you don't agree that insan has full freedom. Second one, if we were to agree that Allah has complete control, then tomorrow Allah will not have any right to justify and ask us if he has to go ahead and punish us. Why is he punishing us? If we were much good, you think if I made someone go through some difficulty and make them commit some sin, can I go ahead and put that person behind the bars? I made them purposely commit the sin. How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then put us behind bars tomorrow when he has made us, forced us into doing so? Imam said, no, al amru bain al amrain. It's jabr and ikhtiyar all together. Yes, it is something which is in between the third halat, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sharik ghalib. Don't think that you as an insan is sharik ghalib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the upper hand, but at the same time, he has given you the freedom to do and choose whatever it is that you want to do. Salat Muhammad. Muhammad. Imam Ali Sattar said, solve this issue. And not just Imam, but even the companions and the students of Imam. There was this man by the name Hisham ibn Hakam, who, of course, was the um, you know, student of sixth Imam as well as the student of seventh Imam. He served under both Imams. And one of the phenomenal students of Imam who propagated the madhab to the great extent, to the extent that Imam would appreciate the work that he had done. And he fought and he stood up explaining the mas'alai imamat. You know, today we have in the world, it's still many people have a hard time believing in the concept of Imam. Many of our, you know, Baradrane Madhab Digar that are under the umbrella of Islam, they don't believe in the concept of Imam. They don't believe in the concept that there is an Imam who's alive right now. What have we done to introduce this Imam of ours to them? We have done nothing to introduce our Imam. While Imam is saying what? Mention Mahasine Kalamina. Go ahead and talk to them and tell them about the beauty of our Kalam. Just mentioning the beauty of our Kalam will attract these individuals to our path. But what have we done? If anything, we have deterred these people further away and kept them away from him. Imam al -Satu was salam here, when he has trained this individual Hisham, what does Hisham do? Hisham debates people in regards to Imam. And he speaks without going in the details of the depth of the knowledge, because not everybody will be able to understand that. Very simple steps. And those who are able to understand, he uh, up the ante when he went and he extended to the occasion where he realized that this person is knowledgeable, let me give him different, different uh, proofs. But for an ordinary individual, this is how he spoke. He said what? He said, imagine, do you agree that after the wafat of Rasulullah, when Rasulullah left this world, the entire ummah was at the same level of knowledge? Meaning Ali, meaning the Khulafa, and forget the Masum Imam, all the other people. Were they all at the same level of knowledge? Can you compare people like Salman, Abu Dhar, Miqdad, Bilal, and others? to those others who existed at the time, like Abu Sufyan and Muawiyah and others? 
He said, no, we can't compare. We can't say that all of them were equal after the wafat of Rasulullah. He said, when they were not all equal after the wafat of Rasulullah, the second situation that we can think of is that all the taklifat or takarif, ash-shari'iyah, the wajibat and muharramat were lifted after the wafat of Rasulullah. People say, no, that is not true either. It's still we have to perform the wajibat. It's still we have to refrain from muharramat. So wajib and haram is still intact today. And not everyone is at the same level as the level of Rasulullah as far as his knowledge is concerned. Imam said, then don't your mind think for a second that when the muharramat are still there, wajibat are still there, ahkam shara'i are still there, and yet people are not at the same level as the level of Rasulullah. Then is it possible there shouldn't be someone? Isn't your mind thinking that there should be the existence of an individual who can replace Rasulullah at the same level and who's able to guide us as well? Wow. Right away, people said, yes, there is a need of certain individual. There is a need of certain individuals. Said, who is that individual? Rasulullah did not appoint anyone. He said, you may have been sleeping through the occasions uh, such as Ghadir Khum. You may have been sleeping through the occasions uh, and such as when Ali slept on the bed of Rasulullah on the night of Hijrah. You must have been sleeping through the occasions when Amir al-Mu'mineen was appointed to stay back when Rasulullah was going for Tabuk. All of the places where Rasulullah said, isn't it enough for you, O Ali? Anta minni ka, uh, Haruna min Musa, you are to me like Harun was to Musa. Illa la Nabi Jabadi. Isn't it enough for you, Ali, that you sold your nafs to, to get the raza of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Isn't it enough for you, Ali, that I raised you in my arms and I said, Man kuntu mawla, fahada Ali yun mawla. Salat al Muhammad wa Ali So therefore, we find that Imam Salam, you know, throughout his life, he trains such individuals. And this is, becomes our utmost duty. It's not only the duty and the wadifa of those who necessarily come and sit on the mimbar to be able to introduce to the world these great personalities. Now, why do you want to keep these personalities hidden from, you know, ma'rifat? of other individuals. Imams with their one action was a, were able to turn people inside out. You've heard the waqi of Bishra, Bishra Hafi. He's known as Bishra Hafi because he walked barefoot. Imam went past his house. He heard the sound of music coming out of the house. Yesterday or the other day, I guess maybe Thursday night, I gave this example of Iman. That when the Iman is like this light, when the Roshini of Iman is a lot, when it's illuminated, you can even see the light outside. People who are walking by, they can see the light inside. And because of this light, which is Roshan, even outside, people can benefit from the light, which is inside this hall. Same way Iman is in your heart. When the illumination and the light of Iman increases in your heart, not only it illuminates you, takes you away from darkness, but also because the light must come out in certain form, it also guides other people in, around you. The fact that your Iman is increasing, people around you, their Iman is also increasing because the same way the person can benefit from this light outside the hall, the same way people will benefit from your Iman outside of your heart as well. We see that Iman was walking by this house and he heard the noise of music coming from it. Imam heard the noise of music. Imam stopped. He knocked on the door. A Kanis came out. Imam said, Who, whose house is this? She says, so and so. Imam said, is he a free man or is he a slave? She got offended. She said, he's a free man. He's not a slave. Because back then, of course, yeah, there was a matter of status that you were either free or you were a slave. He said, no, my master is free. Imam said, I wish he was a slave. And Imam walked away. When it was a while before this Kaniz went back, the master asked him, what happened? What took you so long? She said there was a man. What did he say? He said this. Bishra Hafi, he realized the mistake that he had made and the person who was behind the door. He understood it wasn't an ordinary individual. It was the Imam of the time. 
who had awakened the consciousness of Bishra Hafi, who was in a slumber, who was sleeping, and he was heedless because of this intoxication of the music that was ringing in his ears. He ran out the house barefoot to go and seek up to Imam and ask Imam for the apology and to make tawbah that Imam, I will not commit this sin ever again. We have this example. I'm sure this is not the first time we heard this example. I'm sure you've been repeatedly hearing this issue and this uh, you know, story of Bishr Hafi. How many times you've heard the story? Either one, you don't believe in this story, or if you do believe in this story, then I don't know what would be the reason that you continue to do what Bishr Hafi was used to do. I don't know what is it that it still makes you commit that sin which Bishr Hafi used to do. So therefore, if music is still in our lives uh, and we only put it away for a few days of Muharram al-Haram out of the love of Imam Hussein, then we have not learned anything from the kalam of seventh Imam, Imam Musa al-Kazim alayhi salatu wa salam. Muhammad wa alayhi So therefore, to bring you towards the end, Imam alayhi salatu wa salam is spent about 14 years in the prisons a lot of time people mention that Imam Salam spent longer an entire life in prison. No, that was not the case. Imam Salam, you know, he was born in the year 128. He spent about 20 years under the Imamat of his father, sixth Imam, until his Shahadat in the year 148. And then his own uh, Imamat begins in the year 148 until the year 183. 35 years of the imamat of imam, 55 years of the life of imam, out of which 14 years were spent in the prison. Indeed, 14 years is a long, long time. And that is enough for someone to be thrown back to the extent that people would not even remember such an individual. But these were not ordinary individuals, were they? Imam wasalam, makes a dua. Oh Allah, so when Imam was thrown into the prison, when Imam spent so many years in the prison, what did Imam say? Did Imam become an idol? Did Imam become, a, uh, you know, just put his hand on top of the hand and mayusi and despair that there's nothing could be done. I'm inside this prison, this dark prison, nothing can be done. No, Imam said to oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I ask you to give me the opportunity to better serve you, to be able to do your ibadat in the better form. You gave me this opportunity by putting me into this habs and putting me into this prison. While many of us will be crying over the fact that why am I in this prison? Uh, how can I get out of this prison? Imam is looking at it from the other positive aspect and the positive view. That yes, while I'm in this prison where nobody wants to be, but this is where I have this for a sat to go ahead and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that I was not able to do so when I was outside of this prison. So sometimes when opportunities are thrown at you, it's how you treat those opportunities, how you take those opportunities and how you deal with them. An ordinary person would give up right away. But Imam is teaching us something else. When you are facing adversity in your life, when you are going through musibat in your life, when this musibat is in, in, uh, becoming longer and longer and it becomes like it's never ending, don't give up over there. Have the belief in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La Don't lose hope because losing hope is kufr and kufr is something which is not permissible. Imam spent 14 years and these were not ordinary prisons, brothers and sisters. Some of the prisons that are mentioned in the books of Ahadith or the books of history are the prisons where Imam was not even able to stand up properly. You know, they were so low as far as the ceiling was concerned that Imam was not even able to stand up straight. Just imagine. They were so dark that Imam was not even able to see his own hands properly. How would Imam spend it? These weren't these luxury prisons that you and I have come to understand. No, this type of dungeon, a prison where you would call it a dungeon, Imams were left into. And not just that. Then these people who are guards of these prisons, they were given some, you know, strict instructions that make sure that 
تو اس کے ساتھ آسانی سے پیش مت آنا اس کے اوپر مشکلات کو سامنے رکھنا میک شیور دیٹ یو گیو ہم آل دا ٹربل دیٹ یو کین میک شیور دیٹ یو گیو ہم دا ہارڈسٹ ٹائم دیٹ یو کین میک شیور دیٹ یو ڈونٹ الاؤ ہم ٹو ڈو اینی تھنگ بٹ اٹ واز آل ان وین وائی بیکاز ایوری ٹائم سم ون ووڈ گو اہیڈ اینڈ ٹرائی ٹو بی اسٹرکٹ ود امام دے ووڈ گیو اپ سینگ دیٹ ہاؤ کین وی بی اسٹرکٹ ود این انڈیویجول ہو اسپینڈ دی انٹائر نائٹ ڈوئنگ دی عبادت اف اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی اسپینڈ the entire night is standing in the ibadat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he spends the entire day fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hum kaise is shakhs ke upar kisi cheez ki sakhti kar sake ke jo shakhs siwaye roza rakhne ke siwaye ibadat karne ke koi kaam aur anjaam nahi de raha ajrukum allah may allah give you no grief may allah give you no sorrow imam alaihi salatu wassalam pe ek ke baad ek musibat aati jab یہ سارے ہر میں نہ چلے تو ہارون نے ایک عورت کو بھیجا تاکہ امام کو برغلا سکے امام نے اس عورت کو اپنی انگلیوں کے درمیان وہ جنت کا نظارہ دکھایا کہاں جہاں ہوں عین منتظر ہیں وہاں مجھے اس چیز کی ضرورت نہیں جب آگے ہارون نے دیکھا تو وہ عورت بھی امام کے ساتھ عبادت میں مشغول تھی یا وہ یہ عورت بھی بہت بڑی عبادت گزار بن گئی تھی یہ طریقہ تھا امام کی تبلیغ کا کہ حتیٰ وہ لوگ جو امام کی جان کے دشمن تھے جو امام پہ سختیوں کو چڑھا رہے تھے امام ان کے ساتھ کس طریقے سے پیش آتے تھے لیکن آخر میں سندی ابن شاہ کی زندہ میں امام کو بھیجا گیا اور اس سے کہا گیا کہ امام پہ اتنی سختیاں کرنا کہ وہ برداشت نہ کر سکے اور ایسا لگے کہ وہ اس دنیا سے زندہ میں رہتے ہوئے گزر گئے اس نے اپنی حد تو امکان کوشش کی لیکن اس کے باوجود حکومت وقت کو ڈر تھا امام کو ایک ایسا سم دیا گیا امام کو ایسا زہر دیا گیا جس کو کھاتے ہی امام کے جگر کے ٹکڑے ہونا شروع امام کو پتا چل گیا اب کچھ ہی دنوں کے مہمان ہیں حکومت نے دکھانا چاہا موسا ابن جعفر کے قتل میں ان کے مرنے میں ہمارا کوئی ہاتھ نہیں امام کا جنازہ نکلا تو ضرور لیکن جسد کرب جسد بغداد پہ تین دن تک پڑا رہا نہ جانے والے گزر کے جا سکتے نہ آنے والے آ سکتے ارے بیچ میں ایک جنازہ پڑا ہے یہاں تک کہ تین دن گزر گئے تب آ کے امام کے جنازے کو اٹھایا اور امام کی تدفین ہوئی ارے بڑی پرشکو تدفین اللہ کو نے امام کے جنازے میں شرکت کی لیکن میں کہوں گا موسا بن جعفر سلام ہو آپ پہ ارے آج بھی لاکھوں کی تعداد میں آتے ہیں لیکن پھر بھی آپ کا جنازہ اٹھا ارے ہائے آپ کے جد حسین سید الشہداء تین دن تک لاشا پڑا رہا مگر کوئی اٹھانے والا نہ تھا کیوں سر
السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا كعبة الإيمان السلام عليك يا إمامنا وإمام الإنس والجان عجل الله تعالى فرجك وأسهل الله تعالى مخرجك وطهورك وجعلنا من أنصارك وأعوانك تحت لوائك السلام عليكم يا أهل بيت النبوة جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته